Professor Clarence E. Toots, a Professor Emeritus from the Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, I've looked forward to this uh, interview for some time. As I mentioned to you before, I've started this little oral history project where I interviewed some of the old timers. And in as much as uh, you're an individual that played an exceptionally important part in the early history of the Electrical Engineering Department, I've been looking forward to this interview with you. Why don't you tell me, when did you first come to RIT? How did you have to come here? Well, that uh, the year I came here was 1927. All right, go ahead. Uh, I was working with a consumer's power company in Jackson, Michigan, and I came east on my vacation that year with the intent of going to Clarkson, where my old professor uh, was still active, and I thought I had in mind getting a teaching job. I went up to see him, and he had nothing at the moment, and then my family was with me, and we came back to Watertown, where my, my wife's family lived. And we, uh, during that week, I got a phone call from my sister, who was going to Potsdam uh, Normal, it was then. And she said Professor Powers had told her to get in touch with me and tell me that there was an opening at Mechanics Institute in Rochester. So I immediately uh, wrote a letter down to the Institute addressed to William Fenniger, who was head of the electrical department. And uh, on Friday of that week, I got a letter back from him saying that they would meet me Saturday afternoon. He and Mr. Randall, President of the Institute, would meet me Saturday afternoon. And I got in there, and I had, oh, I had two or three hours with them. And uh, as a result of it, uh, the way it was left was that uh, they'd leave it for a week, and if they were still of a mind to offer me a contract, they'd send it to me in Jackson, Michigan. And if I uh, hadn't changed my mind, well, I'd have the contract and I could send it back. And I had told them what I would come for. And uh, I got, in due time, I got the, I got the contract. I signed it immediately and sent it back. So then you came on to the Institute faculty in the fall of uh, 1927. 1927. Mm -hmm. And where had you taken your undergraduate work, Clarence? Uh, my work was all at Clarkson. All at Clarkson. So you got your baccalaureate there and earlier. I have my baccalaureate uh, in electrical engineering. I also have my electrical engineer's degree, mm -hmm. the EE, Yo. from Clarkson. Mm -hmm. And uh, when you came on to the Institute faculty, who all else was on the faculty at that time? Uh, Bill Feniger was head of the electrical department. Earl Moorcock was here. Earl Harker was here, who has since passed away. Um, and there were two other men who came at the same time I did. And neither of them stayed very long. There was a fellow by the name of George Davis, who had been at Cornell. And there was a fellow by the name of uh, uh, it escapes me right at the moment, but uh, he was here only one year. I see. <coughs> and, uh, well, Al Johns at the time was uh, head of the Industrial Arts Division, the Mechanics Institute, as it was known then. And that Industrial Arts Division consisted of the electrical department? The mechanical, mechanical department. I guess that's all. Industrial chemistry? Oh, yes, industrial mm -hmm. chemistry. Oh. That's right. Mm -hmm. I see. Now, uh, uh, who all was in the uh, mechanical department? Do you remember any of those? Yes. Um, Fred Evans was head of the department. Uh, Arthur Anderson was teaching there. Uh, Louis Edgerton. Uh, Herman Martin? Herman Martin, no. Herman Martin wasn't in there at that time. Herman Martin was head of the evening school. I see. But... Uh, uh, Ed, I mentioned Edgerton. Mm -hmm. uh, there was someone else that. Oh, Bud Lane. Oh, yes. 
came at the same time I did, the same year, that same fall. And then he was in the mechanical door. And another chap by the name of Godfrey, I don't know whether you ever knew him or not. No. But uh, I don't remember his first name. To me, he was Mr. Godfrey because he was quite an old timer. Yeah. And he had done a great deal of work in the, I believe, in the Coast and Geodetic Survey. Oh, and he was teaching mathematics. Yeah. Well, now, in the fall of uh, 27, when you came, there were about five and four or five on the electrical faculty then. Yes. And about how many students did you have? What was it? Was it a three-year course in those it days? It was a three-year course. And we had a, a large influx of freshman students that fall. Uh, large, I say, as it was large for the department at the time. Sure. I think there were something like 125 or 30 students coming in as freshmen that year. Now, the co-op program operated right from the beginning, didn't it? Yes. So the students were divided into two blocks. Two groups. And uh, half of them went out on the work block. And, and the other half were in school. Mm -hmm. But uh, the changeover period wasn't a three-month period at that time. It was only a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. They'd be out at work for a couple of weeks, and then they'd change over and come, back, come into school while the other group went out. Yeah. Well, now, when I came to Institute in 39, the period of alternation was uh, four weeks. Four weeks. Do you remember when it shifted from two to four? No, I don't. I can't tell you that, but it very, it very soon became obvious that a two-week period was too short. Yeah. And it was shifted to four. I think it was very soon. I can't tell you just exactly how many years, yeah. but not many. And I think it was after World War II that it shifted to the three months period. Three months period. Yes, yes. I think so. Right. Uh, well, now uh, tell them, tell us a little bit about the subjects that you taught, and also a little bit about the curriculum there in the electrical department. Well, I came here primarily to teach drafting because the man who was teaching it had gone back, or was going back, to Ohio State. He got, his, he got his job back again there, apparently. Mm -hmm. I've forgotten his name, but uh, he was the man I was to replace. And I took over the drafting in the electrical department. Now, I had been working in the drafting room for the consumer car company for about three years. So, so you knew electrical drafting. So, so I knew electrical sure. drafting, and that's what they wanted, somebody who knew something about electrical drafting. Mm -hmm. Well, this fellow's name was Martin, Floyd Martin. You didn't know, probably never heard of him. Well, he, he was the one who I replaced. Mm -hmm. And then what else uh, did the students take uh, during their freshman year, for example, and then later years? Well, I not only taught the drafting, see, the freshmen took their mechanical drawing from Steve Brody. Nice. I started with the second year men with a, an electrical drafting course and an electrical design course in the third year. Mm -hmm. And we had those three years only. Uh, so I not only taught those two courses in drafting, but I did some of the work in the freshman laboratory, and I taught a mathematics course. About what was the teaching hour, the teaching load in hours in those days? No, they were they were heavy, anywhere from 25 to 30 hours or more. Mm -hmm. That was a real teaching load. Then you might have evening school assignment addition. Oh yes, you had evening school assignments with no additional pay. I remember when I came to the institute, there was a what was known as the full professional time and energy contract. That's exactly what ours was too. <laughs> they weren't kidding when they said they that. They weren't kidding when they said that. Yeah, so that actually. You probably spent between your evening and your day 30 hours or more in the classroom. I surely did, yes. Yeah. Very definitely. Most of it. If you had a laboratory, it was a three hour lab. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what were some of the other subjects <coughs> that the, the uh, freshman electricals would take, for example? Uh, out of, they took their mathematics, they took their mechanical drawing, uh, they took their electrical circuit classes and out of department classes I think there was something along the social science line mm -hmm. I don't recall exactly what the, it was called at the yeah. time but there was something on, along that line human relations or something something of that nature no. yes mm -hmm. I don't believe they even called it human relations then no. uh, but they had at least one liberal subject yes they had a liberal subject yeah. one anyway yeah. uh, now, 
you mentioned the industrial arts division of the institute. There was also an art division, was it not, and a home economics yes. division. Yes. And uh, do you remember who was in charge of, uh, of the art? Uh, Clifford Alp. Was he in charge at that time? Yeah. Clifford Alp oh, was here I then. I, I got to know Clifford Alp very well because we were both baseball enthusiasts. <laughs> I see. Good enough. And then in uh, home act, was that Miss Benedict? Miss May Benedict? I believe it was. Yes. She was here at the time, and I believe she did handle it. She had a, uh, a strong department there in the early years. She surely did. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, and President Randall had been president since the early 20s, as I remember. Yes, yeah, I think, I don't remember when he came here, of course, but he was here when I came here, and I'm sure that he was here when uh, my very good friend, Earl Moorcock, came, which was in 24. Mm -hmm. I think Mr. Randall was here before that. Yeah, first few years, yeah. Uh, before you came to the Institute, did you know much about it? Uh, the Clarkson Man, would you have known much about it? Yes. That? I knew quite a little about the Institute, and I'll tell you why. Uh, I was the sports editor for the magazine, the student magazine at Clarkson. We played Mechanics Institute teams. I can remember very distinctly of Sherman Hagworth winning the football team up there. <laughs> So I knew something about Mechanics Institute, and uh, some of the Mechanics Institute football players came to transfer to Clarkson and played on the football team up there. I see. I see. So I got to know a little something about it. Enough. And uh, in later years, though, Clarkson wasn't very uh, flexible about uh, accepting RIT That's true. graduates. So they That's worked true. for a while, and then I guess they tightened up. Well, this was the result of one faculty member there who had something to do with it. Mm -hmm. I was very provoked about it and I got in touch with one of the other I got in touch with one of the other faculty members who eventually became the president and he was very much disturbed about it. And he knew what had happened. Mm -hmm. But uh, in the fall of nineteen in the summer of nineteen thirty I took seven or eight of our electrical students up there and got them registered at Clarkson. Mm -hmm. Now, who were some of those uh, fellows uh, that I took up? Yeah, they went on to Clarkson and got the degrees. In the well, year. Red Van Horn was one. Was uh, that Bert Van Horn? No, Bert's brother. Oh, I see. Bert was a U of R man. Mm -hmm. But this Red, his name was... <laughs> those names escape me every once in a while. Sure. Uh, Winfield. 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 Yeah. Oh, I see. Uh, and uh, George Whitney. Who, late, who in later years was down at Alfred in the Technical Institute. That's there. right. He was head of one of the departments down there. That's right. Otto Klickdorn, who Otto was in the State Department. Well, and he became president of the New York City Community Club. He surely did. Yeah. Yes. And uh, Don Fish, Freddie, Freddie Gardner, Charlie Calla. Who was Charlie? Uh, one of them. Yes. Then there was a chap that was at uh, Bloom Tech in electrical. Oh, Sitterly. Sitterly. Yes. Larry Sitterly. He was one of them. Yeah. Now, I don't know that I took, uh, Sitterly was in the group that I took up that time, but it was around that time mm -hmm. that these fellows all went to Clarkson. Mm -hmm. And they all did very well up there. Yeah. And they made quite a name for themselves later in this whole New York State uh, Technical Institute field. Yes, they did. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in fact, the state of New York looked pretty much to RIT when they developed their own. Uh, it was patterned institute. after the institute program. Yeah. Uh, are there other uh, students that you remember? Because you had a long experience here at RIT with uh, re students that really made a name for themselves. Oh, yes, there must be. Uh, I can tell you a couple of others that I think about. That, uh, but there are more than that. But uh, uh, Alexander Duckett was hired. He was in Albany working in the State Department after he graduated from here and also graduated from Clarkson. And he was hired by the government to set up a technical institute over in Burma. I remember the name. And again. he came to the institute to try to get me to go over to Burma with him. <laughs> I didn't want any part. No. But uh, that was one of them, Jimmy Daly. Uh, taught in the technical the, in a technical institute over I know what it was Erie Tech over near Buffalo mm -hmm. and I'm not sure he was living in Lockport mm -hmm. 
and there may have been some technical program there. But he was in the he was in the technical institute program too. Uh, I don't know. Uh, it's difficult to one of the um, one of the most pleasant experiences was to have a man out of the class of 1928, which was the first graduating class after I came here, was to have a man there who had been uh, never very good in his high school days, and he came to the Institute, and I had him during that last year, and his name was Adair, Jimmy Adair, and boy, he went places after he got through here. Good. Very, very, he went way up somewhere. Well, now, somewhere along here, Lou Wilson, who later became Commissioner of Education for the State of New York, had attended the Institute. Was that? This was before my time. This was before your time. Yes, this was before my time. I, I got to know who he was. Yes. But that was before my time. I see that before. Uh, the, uh, this co-op plan, of course, had been in effect at the Institute. Uh, since 1912, and I guess during World War I it was abandoned, but then after uh, World War I it was picked up again, and of course it was in effect when you came. That's what right. happened to the co-op plan during the Depression? Well, we couldn't get many jobs, but <clears throat> we had still had contact with these various companies, and a company would call in and say, we need a dozen students for a couple of weeks. Can you let us have them? And we send those boys out. And under these conditions, we had to start up an individualized instruction course. We were not doing lecturing to, to classes then. We were just supervising class study. Mm -hmm. And I had freshmen, juniors, and seniors all in my class at the time. No, this was primarily as a result of the depression. As a result of the depression, Although that's when right. When you first came in 27, you carried on normal. Oh yes. Classes. Oh yes. Then as the depression worsened, then we, got into we had to do this. And this didn't come until, well, 32, 33, yeah. that sort of thing. Uh, we had a big class in entering in 27, and another one in 28, and another one in 29. Yeah. But in 30, then the, the entrance, the, the bottom dropped right out, and the en entering class was very small. Yeah. Now in this individualized instruction, uh, you had to prepare your own manual you so that each student your own had, a, had a copy of it. And uh, what, did they go along pretty much at their own speed? They went along at their own speed, and you were just there in the classroom, not only supervising, but uh, helping them as helping they needed help. And uh, then as the student finished a particular unit, he went on to the next He one. went on to the next one. What happened if he finished the course in the middle of the year? Well, he didn't have to uh, stay in school but he would be on the graduating list, or if it was in the third year, if it was in the, he could, if it was in the first year, he could continue right on uh, into the second year program if he wanted to. Yeah. Well, you hear a lot about the individualized education these days, and the cycle sort of turns. Yeah. And uh, the institute was doing it clear back there. In the clear back then. Yeah. This was the time when I wrote up the mathematics material that later, developed into the mathematics mm -hmm. book that, I, that was published by Prentice Hall. Yeah. Uh, what is your own reaction as to the effectiveness of the co-op plan? Oh, it's very good. I have often thought that I wish I could have had this type of course when I took my engineering work at Clark State. Often thought that I'd like to have had the benefit of a co-op course. I remember even when I came in 39 and the students were still being split in two blocks before the freshman year, that the faculty would frequently say, well, it's funny, but the uh, the B block, the block that's already had one uh, work experience, are more mature than the A block. Uh, actually, about the only difference was there's a little work experience that's on right. part of the B block. They were beginning to learn to get along with people. That's right. Uh, Clarence, what were some of the greatest satisfactions that you had uh, during the time here at the Institute? and also some of the greatest disappointments. Well, I don't believe I ever had any real disappointments at the Institute. I've always liked the work here, always. Uh, teaching was my fort, there wasn't any question about it. 
and I liked it very much. Uh, there were some, oh, there were some things that I perhaps didn't agree with, but on the other hand, this is always true wherever you were. Sure. But the fact that I could get in with the students, I became a, uh, an advisor for one of the fraternities. I entered into the uh, sports program considerably. Uh, did uh, a lot of the baseball work in the spring myself for, for a softball league, and I got to know a lot of students. And one of the things that certainly appealed to me and uh, uh, made me feel that my life's work was, was really meant something, students that I have had contact with out of the department, when they came back, I was about the first one they came to see. That's quite a tribute. And that, that made me feel very good. Uh, I, as a matter of fact, one of the mechanical boys uh, came to me to see about going to Clarkson. And he'd been on the sports teams here and that sort of thing. And this, this made me feel good to not to think that these boys would, even though they weren't my own students, they'd come back to see me before they would anyone else. Great. Well, you had a marvelous rapport with students, both within and without the department. And as I remember, you also had an excellent memory. You knew what happened to a great number of them. Oh, yes. Yeah, that, my memory is beginning to uh, get, become what I forget with now, but <laughs> nevertheless, uh, those memories stay with me. Mm -hmm. Very definitely. Uh, the, uh, then I take it the greatest satisfaction were in working with the students and coming to know them uh, real well. Sort of keeping well, in touch it, with there was a great satisfaction. Mm -hmm. And uh, even today, it's very satisfying to have students from distant parts of the country, students who've been in my classes, come see me down Sarasota. Uh, Joe Tabor, who graduated in the class of 1936, has just recently, with his wife, visited us in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. George Whitney, uh, came down with uh, uh, another student, I've forgotten his name now, but uh, they came down to see me purposely. Because they were up in uh, St. Petersburg, mm -hmm. and they came down to see me. And this is a great satisfaction to have these fellows look me up. Yes. Well, certainly those individuals that uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, Whitney and Sitterly and uh, Otto Clifford, uh and the others, all had a great feeling of affection for the Institute. They surely did. And they sent many of their graduates on to RIT after the That's Institute right. started granting uh, this is baccalaureate they uh, degrees. Yeah. Yeah. We had sort of a farm team in operation out here in all the state institutes. That's right. That's right. Well, now, how did, the, uh, how did the curriculum change? You were here from 27 then, and you retired in June 66. of... 66. June of 66. Yes. So that was a total of... 40 years. 39 years, 39 and then I went on three years just as a lecturer right. in the math department. Teaching math, huh? Yeah. yeah. How did the curriculum change over these years, Clarence? Well, uh, I don't believe the curriculum changed uh, a great deal for a long time because there wasn't much change in the way of teaching electrical subjects until we got into into uh, the programs where we had to do something with computers. Mm -hmm. And also, they began teaching uh, electrical machinery in an entirely different way, from an energy standpoint, nice. which we hadn't done before. It all ended up with the same result. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, was, it wasn't until things like that came on, uh, when we got to talking about energy, we got to talking about computer programs. Yes that the curriculum changed drastically then. Yeah. Well, now, as I remember, when, we, when the Institute went into, uh, into the baccalaureate degree granting field, which was about the mid-50s, yes. we initiated what we called topping programs. Yes. And we built the top two years upon the first three. That's right. Which was sort of heresy as far as the traditional engineering school went. Yes. And uh, the ECPD people didn't like that. But we did... Uh, as I remember, get into more math. Mm -hmm. Went quite a bit further in math for the uh, students than they've had in the, in the early years. That's right. 
and we had to do that. You know, if we were going to give a baccalaureate degree, we had to go farther in mathematics, no question. So that uh, that really did change. That, that was a change. That was a change. And then, of course, the state had certain requirements with respect to general education. That's right. So and there was more of that in, in, uh, incorporated. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had to adhere to that, uh, for sure. Uh, the, uh, if you, as you look back on your experience and uh, uh, reflect on it, if you had any uh, thing to suggest, what would you change the way the institute was organized, the way the curriculum was organized? Uh, that'd be a rather difficult one to, at the moment to answer, I guess. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't see much use in uh, any drastic change because I, the one of the, one of the things that was very very good about the institute was that in those early days every teacher that was here was a strongly dedicated individual, and uh, it's not so much what material you're teaching is it is the way you're putting it across. Mm -hmm. And this, I think, made all the difference in the world. Uh, how the Institute uh, faculty uh, sees this now, I don't know, but uh, I do know that my last few years here, it seemed as though many of them weren't as dedicated as they were in those early days. Mm -hmm. That's the way it seems. Of course, I suppose part of that is the sheer size of the institute. I expect it is. And the uh, the geographical location out here is entirely different than when we were down on Plymouth Avenue. That's right. Because there, everybody saw everybody practically every All month. All the time. Out. All mm -hmm. the time. That's right. And there was a feeling of uh, togetherness, whether you wanted it or not. You yeah. were together in the lunch. There certainly room. was. There certainly was that, uh, that feeling of uh, being a member of the group. Yes. Uh, there's one uh, factor here we haven't touched on yet, and uh, I'm sure that both of us uh, realize the importance, and that is the coming of Mark Ellingson as president of the Institute. Yes. Uh, when I came here, Dr. Randall was president of the Institute, and I believe that Mark was made acting president about 1935 or 6, when Dr. Randall uh, retired. And Mark, being a very dynamic individual, meant an awful, an awful lot to the growth of this institution. That's right. And uh, it was small then, and uh, he had the uh, faculty or the facility for pulling the group together. And, uh, he certainly did. There was a great, uh, great feeling of loyalty. Uh, I think we're about to the end of uh, one side of this tape, oh. and we better turn it over, so we'll just stop for a moment. Well, certainly... Uh, under Dr. Ellingson's leadership, the Institute uh, grew both uh, physically and educationally and financially, financial Definitely. stability. And, uh, and acquired a very, very good reputation. That's right. What were some of the problems that our uh, graduates of the three-year program were having? And a, a certain percentage of them wanted to go on for their baccalaureate degree. and. Uh, what do you remember? Where did they go after the after the Clarkson uh, group went through and Clarkson ceased to be very flexible in their granting and transfer credits? What happened to some of your graduates after that? Well, I might uh, I might indicate this. I think the Clarkson situation uh, reverted back after a while because of a situation that developed while I was in contact with it. The uh, employment manager at Kodak had a son who was in our mechanical department. And uh, he came to me to see about what he could do about going to Clark's. And this was while he was in his second year here. Now, at the in the spring of his third year, he went up there to Clarkson, and he thought that he had everything arranged when he came back. And that fall, when he went back up there, or whether they, whether he went back up there, or whether they wrote to him and told him that he would have to uh, uh, practically start right in from scratch. Now, this was one individual on the faculty who, uh, who made this decision. 
and it's one whom he hadn't seen when he was up there. I knew the chap, and I wrote a letter to the president of the institute at the time, and he was very much disturbed, uh, president of Clarkson, he was very much disturbed. And the upshot of it was that this boy went to Ohio State, got credit for the work he'd done at the institute, and finished up at Ohio State. Mm -hmm. And this, of course, uh, made them stop and think at Clarkson. Sure. And Ohio State would give him credit for what he had done here. It made a difference. And I think uh, later on that they weren't nearly so rigid in their requirements, no. so that some others did go there. Yeah. Didn't uh, a fair number go to uh, Michigan State? I believe so. And there were some that even went out to Vanderbilt. Ames. Yeah, I know quite a few of the chemistry students. Went, went to Ames, Ames. Yeah. that's right. But I think also someone went down to Vanderbilt, wasn't it? Wally Criley? Uh, Walter Criley went to Vanderbilt, and some of the students went down there, yes. Mm -hmm. I don't know how many. Uh, Criley had been on our faculty he here. He had been on our faculty. Yeah. Criley was an excellent teacher. Moved to Vanderbilt. Yeah. And we sort of encouraged some of the fellows to go down there. And That's right. A decent to break as far as transfer. That's right. Walter was an excellent teacher, and the only reason he left the Institute, I think, was because he wanted to get into a warmer climate. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was any other reason. No. Well, certainly uh, Nashville would be a warmer climate. It sure would, <laughs> than Rochester. Yeah. But uh, I believe that there were more, probably went on from the electrical department to get their baccalaureate and from any other department. I think that's true, and probably the answer to that was that uh, three or four of us in the electrical department were very much interested in these students going on if they wanted to, mm -hmm. and they would come to us and we would try to guide them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that was the answer to it. That's right. Now, Clarence, you were in Rochester here then a long while. Uh, as you look back, think about it, what was the change in attitude, if any, on the part of the high school guidance people, on the part of the industrial personnel people, on the part of uh, sort of the community in general, its attitude towards the Institute over these years? I think the biggest change came as a result of these, a lot of these people beginning to realize that the courses at the Institute were definitely college caliber. Now, some of our students would work at these various companies while they were on co-op jobs, and they, and quite often the uh, attitude they would find would be that the boss, the foreman under whom they were working, uh, didn't think the courses at the Institute wanted anything. Well, that gradually changed over a period of time, and eventually they got to the point where they began to realize that our courses were. Mm -hmm. Caliber, uh, college caliber courses, and uh, uh, they had more respect for what we were doing. And I think this uh, this was a big change. Uh, I suppose, in part, this became uh, true due to the outstanding job that I think the institute was doing, and also our moving to the degree granting uh, well, I category. Think, yes, I think that was uh, in uh, largely responsible for it. Yes. Uh, because you were here when we moved first to the associate degree, granting the associate degree in about 1950, and then that's right. granting the baccalaureate in about 1955. And uh, this made it a great deal easier, of course, for our students to obtain, obtain positions and also to, uh, uh, if they wanted to go, well, before we, get, uh, we granted the baccalaureate, the AAS made it more easier for the students to go on and get their baccalaureate degree, as long as we were giving the AAS, because they were in a position where the state was doing this thing, too. Sure. And, of course, the state two-year schools, as they were uh, the new ones that were established after World War II, which were originally called the Institutes of Applied Arts and Sciences, uh, under Governor Dewey, those were patterned largely after, after the course RIT. The Dr. Ellingson had been on the state uh, the committee that had set this up, he'd been an advisor to that committee. That's right. And uh, so they were patterned uh, quite Pretty a bit. Pretty much after our course. That's right. Uh, and then when we moved to the degree granting, uh, the baccalaureate degree granting field, 
Why, many of these uh, two-year graduates from the state schools came right on to R&D. That's right. Moved right into our Moved right program. into our, graduate, our uh, baccalaureate program. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's one thing that I certainly want to get onto this uh, tape here, and it's a thing that uh, you didn't mention it as a satisfaction, but uh, whether it gave you satisfaction or not, it did me. And that was that when we initiated this uh, award for outstanding teaching, well, that was you a were the first one that I was, was the first selected, and I believe that was a graduating group in about 1965. I think so. That was the first that award. That was a marvelous okay. satisfaction to me too. Well, it was a great satisfaction to me to shake your hand and give you that uh, little framed award that we gave to yes, you. Sir, that certainly meant a great deal to me. I have that in my home frame now. Well, I don't blame you at all. I would myself if anyone had ever given me it award like that. Uh, in uh, what way do you think that the Institute's personality, in quotes, has changed uh, since uh, you first came and as you knew it down through your working life here? I don't think the... Uh, well, let me put it this way. Uh, while, we're, while we were down in the city at the old campus, we were just one big family. Everyone knew everyone else. And there was a great uh, camaraderie there, the spirit of that kind. But after the Institute moved to the new campus, uh, the place was, got so large that you don't seem to have that kind of thing so much anymore. And while I taught out here one year, I enjoyed the teaching conditions rooms were nice, and I enjoyed the teaching conditions. But still, that old spirit, as far as I was concerned, wasn't here. I'd go over to the lunch room, and I wouldn't see anyone that I knew. You know, yeah. And this, and down at the old the old uh, place, why, you go down at the lunch room, and a good share of the faculty would be, eat lunch there. Yeah. Really. I don't remember what the maximum enrollment was that we had down on the old campus, but uh, uh, well, of course you've got a bigger enrollment here. The bigger enrollment is about the, the day enrollment here is up six thousand. Yes, like that. and the uh, faculty has increased proportionately, so that uh, kind of geographically uh, they're spread out so much you don't see. Them. You don't see them. That's right. Come mm -hmm. um, What uh, what do you what impact do you think the institute has had on the Rochester community or the Monroe County community or Western New York community over the years? Uh, has this been an instrument for good here? Has it made a great impact or has it meant a great deal? Oh, of course it has. I uh, I couldn't conceive of. Uh the Institute is not having a, a big impact on the whole area around here, and it probably would extend all uh, into these places where we've had where we've had co-op students. I, for instance, remember taking a group of students to Niagara Falls to go through the carborundum plant and also through the power plant over there and things of this kind. And we in the electrical department were doing these things all the time, taking students here, there, and all over. And our students were working in these places, too. And they couldn't help but have a, more, a considerable impact for good on the community here in Monroe County. Now, in the early days, each individual department was responsible for admissions, yes. for co-op placement, That's and right. for placement upon graduation, whether or not. So yes. you, you knew your students so very well. That's right. And you followed them right through from the right from graduate. the beginning to the, until the time they got out and even after graduation. Even after graduation. Mm -hmm. Now you were quite active also in the evening college, which was called in those days, and uh, taught for good many years. I think that's right. Uh, now there, did you teach electrical drafting, or did you supervise a group of? We didn't do any electrical drafting. Of well, not very much. Mm -hmm. Once in a while, someone would come in who wanted to take some drafting work, but not very often. Uh, I was teaching uh, electrical circuits most of the time. I did. I took one class 
right straight through its complete program in the, in the electrical department. I took this class when they were freshmen. This was an evening school class, mm -hmm. and I had, about, I had about 16 or 18 in the class. I took them right through their circuit work. I took them through their second year work. I took them through the third year. And when I ended up, I think I had about 15 out of 17 left. Something like that. The marvelous survival. And uh, that was an excellent class. I had some awfully good students in there. And there was one girl in the class. Some years uh, And she did very, very well. And I'll never forget that last year, she was continually collecting a little money from these fellows. And I never inquired as to what it was all about or anything of the kind. I knew something was going on. At the end of the year, we had a dinner, a graduation dinner, so to speak. And this Anna, Anna, no, not Anna. Her last name was Rose. Anyway, what did she do but get up and present me with a with a Schaefer pen and pencil set from the whole class? Great. And this is what she was collecting the money for. <laughs> She'd collect a quarter a week or something like that from each one. Oh, I see. Well, well, that, that really threw me. Well, that was great, was, yeah. And I, uh, I had a marvelous rapport with that class. So, yeah. how long did you teach in the evening college? In well, I did not teach the first year. Feniger, Mr. Feniger told me that uh, he wouldn't assign me for evening school until the second year, mm -hmm. until I got my. At least right. got my feet wet, so sure. I know what I was doing. But the second year, I got an assignment for teaching, <coughs> and <coughs> that carried on until until the time, and it must have been in the late 40s or early 50s, that uh, I was asked to take over uh, as in charge of the evening school program for the electrical department. Mm -hmm. Uh, counselor, this yeah. is what they call you. Know, I believe you did. This must have been in the late 40s or early 50s. And that, that's, I taught evening school every year until that time. Mm -hmm. And of course, uh, when I took over as counselor, I just had to give up the teaching. Sure. But uh, I uh, got the teachers for the department in the evening school and uh, conferred with them all the time about their courses and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So that uh, I was doing a lot of supervisory work. Yeah. And then did you continue that right up until the time of retirement? Until the time of retirement. Mm -hmm. You had a long experience with I evening school. had a long school. experience with evening school. Mm -hmm. and you had some excellent uh, faculty there, as I remember. Too. Oh, yes. There were some there. And at one time, uh, electrical, well, at one time, every uh, faculty member, full time faculty member, was expected to teach couple of evenings of evening school, if asked to, if called upon. Yeah. If he weren't called upon, why then he, he was that, but he didn't get any extra pay for it. No. If he weren't called upon, why that was, he didn't have to put in the time. Mm -hmm. And he still didn't lose any of his salary. But uh, after a while, uh, the evening school began to, while they were paying these outside people, they found out that they uh, institute people didn't want to go on teaching without being paid extra for it, and I didn't blame them any. Mm -hmm. And after a while, the evening school started paying us extra for, extra for yeah. that evening school assignment. That was sort of the end of the full professional time and energy contract. That's right. That's what it was. That had been a source of uh, irritation for many, for many years. For a long time, yes, it had. But I had an experience, I don't know whether you want this one or not, but I had an experience that uh, uh, seemed to me would uh, point up some of these things. The union, the electrician's union, came to the institute and wanted to put on a couple of weeks, well, not two weeks, but uh, a couple of days for two weeks at a time, and give these... Uh,